Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, President Dale Carnegie took a training in Japan, and my special guest today is Maxime Gilbo, who is the founder and CEO of Ecohe here in Japan. Maxime, welcome. Uh, thank you. What is Ecohe? Tell us about that. Uh, Ecohe is a consulting firm uh, focusing on digital transformation and AI acceleration. So we believe into the transformative power of technology. Uh, we think it changes our lives and uh, for, for, for the better um, most of the time, sometimes a, a bit of uh, bad things, but mostly good, we believe. And so if people uh, want to search on Eco, how do you spell Eco here? How should they search for it? So E-K-O-H-E. E-K-O-H-E. And, e and, and they search for that, they'll find all the information they need about yep. Eco here. Great. Yep. Excellent. So you're in Japan. You founded a company here. Okay, how did you get here? Why Japan? Why this? Let's give us the backstory on okay. Maxime. How did you get to this point in your career, Maxime? How far should I go in the past? <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll find we'll so, find where the relevance bits are. Uh, <clears throat> I landed in Shanghai, in China, in 2004, um, doing a, a, an exchange program with my engineering school, and did a master degree in Shanghai Jiao University in uh, artificial intelligence. This is how I landed in China. This is in Shanghai yeah, or Beijing? In or Shanghai. Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started Ecohi. Where Artificial intelligence in Shanghai. In 2004. In 2004. Why <laughs> yeah. on earth would you go to Shanghai to do AI in 2004? That's a very unique idea yeah, yes. at that time. Yeah, China was not, not very famous for AI at that time. No. Um, but I was interested to go to Asia. And right. it was the only program that was running. Why? Uh, towards Why Asia. are you interested to go to Asia? I have. So I spent some of my childhood in Africa and then sometime in Europe. And that was just a corner of the planet uh, that I didn't get to explore yet. Uh, and also we had uh, quite a few Chinese colleagues in the, doing the same program, but in the reverse way. So you were uh, based in, in where in France? Uh, Lille. So it's, Lyon. Uh, Lille. North of France. North of France, yeah. okay. And so you were doing university there. They had an exchange program with a university in Shanghai. Yes. And that's how you got the chance to come. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then uh, right after I start, I finished the master's degree, started Ecohi, uh, which was kind of a, uh, a consequence of my freelancer work. Uh, this is in work. Shanghai? Yeah. Okay. And started the office there, uh, started a group there. Uh, and so I stayed in Shanghai until 2016. So you started your own company by yourself or with some partners yeah, in Shanghai? By myself, yeah. Well, that's very bold. I mean, you've barely yes. out of uh, university, you've got your own company going. That's very entrepreneurial. Very hard. Very impressive. I don't recommend. <laughs> it was hard. I bet it was hard. Yeah, because you have a uh, yeah, cash flow issues, right? You still need to live. You don't have any savings because you're starting a professional life. So it's tough. Yeah. yeah. Tough. Tough. And tough. also 2007. Uh, it was okay to start 2008, it was much harder to survive too, so yeah, a lot of fun. Did Lehman Shock have any impact on China though? So, not on China, but for our clients in the US. Okay. So we started with So you were mainly targeting Geishke companies, foreign yes. multinationals, but they are operating in China. And yes. so Lehman Shock would have had a direct impact on that. So, business. and we had a lot of work with startups in the US, looking okay. for development help uh, right. in China. So right. we, we had a lot of work like that. And that business was doing what? So at that time, we were doing a lot of web applications. It was kind of the web 2.0 era. Right, right, right. Uh, so a lot of work with startups. And until the end of 2008, we got lucky to find a corporate client to have them do uh, like internal IT systems using web development and databases. Um, and that kind of helped us survive <laughs> at that point because startups were not a thing uh, for that year. Um, and then after that, we did a lot of various things like were mobile applications and start in 2010, and then a lot of data and machine learning and started 2015. So. Hmm. so you're in China quite a long time. Yes, until 2016. Uh, we started the office in Japan in 2015, and I was doing like a lot of trips. So while you were actually in China, you thought, well, I need an office in Japan. Is that how the thought came out? Yep. Why yeah. an office? If you're in Shanghai, you're servicing Geishke multinational companies in ch China. Why do you need an office in Japan? There was a more uh, a bet on diversification. Um, 
You were so uncoupling we, before it was fashionable. <laughs> so we, we started uh, offices also around the same time, started offices in, in Paris uh, as well. And I had a colleague move from Shanghai to Tokyo, uh, oh, working okay. remotely from here. Um, I was also personally very interested uh, by the culture here. Wanted to see something else after 12 years in, in, in China, close enough to be able to uh, do trips. Um, and also, in a way, uh, kind of uh, test the team, whether they're able to execute by themselves and me being a little bit away more often, um, kind of kind of grow up uh, uh, middle management. Yeah. yeah. Forcing um, them to become self-sufficient by disappearing to Japan. Exactly. <laughs> Early retirement. <laughs> Early retirement. <laughs> Not really, but yeah. Not really, no. So unsuccessful, the team, unsuccessful. But it's amazing. You had an office in Paris, you had an office in the States. Where was the office in the States? So in the States, no, we only have one person in New York and mm -hmm. we have an office in Vancouver. Canada, Vancouver, New York, like. Paris, Shanghai, Tokyo. That's pretty amazing. And how yeah. many people were there in China? Um, so we were about, when I, so 2016, maybe about 20, 20 and now maybe 25. So it's still going. So the, yeah. the operation in China is continuing. Yeah. You still own it. Yep. But it's not there operating with you. It's operating by itself because you're you established with your colleague, I guess, the operation here. Is that how yeah. it's worked? Yeah. And how many people operating in uh, Ecohe in Japan? Uh, we're about 10. 10, 10 right? People, so yeah. China's much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you've been in Japan now how long? So it's going to be eight years in May. Eight years in May. Yeah. And the business sort of, you sort of started Web.20 in China. What was the business in Japan or what is the business in Japan? So in Japan, we've been doing work uh, for in retail, e-commerce and digital transformation. Uh, so we had... What does, you know, digital transformation, these words get tossed yeah. around like DX, you know, like what the yeah. hell, what does that mean? What does digital transformation actually <laughs> mean, you know? What are we talking about here? Taking a very analog process and try to create a digital solution around that. Just give me an example. Uh, what so would something like that be for you know? For B two B business, so for example, one of our cases we worked on uh, that B two B business, B two B two C, was receiving a lot of orders by fax. Fax. That'd fax. be Japan, right? Fax Japan would Japan. be fax for sure. Right. We never had that before. <laughs> um, in China, fax never, have never really been a thing. Um, so then we we looked at it. We looked at the business problem and we found find solutions. Right. And so it's called email. Create, created a, <laughs> created an Android app. Uh, distribute um, through all the retailers and uh, create an interface so people can just restock themselves. Right. And you eliminate a lot of manual process errors. And then you have the data in real time, so the business can become much more agile and hence inventory optimization. Then you can introduce AI later. Um, the first step is to have um, to be transformed digitally, right? To have a right. So is that also happening in China? Was that like, for example, are you have you got a sort of a template for the business in China, which you're able to just sort of map onto Japan and bring that in here? So it's basically an existing structure, or are you building something entirely different here in Japan? Our work is very custom. Is it? Uh, okay. Yeah. So mm. we uh, were small for the size of the projects. And so every project is almost like a first time. Right. Um, very yeah. exploratory, this very is, discovery yes. all the time. Yeah. And this is what we like. Right. And uh, you got to 10 people in Japan. Now, mm. this interests me because, you know, um, when we started our franchise in 2007, trying to get Japanese people to come and work for us was a nightmare. Yep. Because we we're, uh, okay, Dale Cunning has been going since 1963, but our franchise started in 2007, and they're all tuned up to go and work for big brand name companies, including foreign companies like, you know, I mean, okay, Dale Cunning has a brand, but it wasn't that powerful enough. So convincing to join was very hard. And here you are, Ecohe, started in Shanghai, uh, doesn't have a track record in Japan, couple of crazy, you know, foreigners <laughs> here starting up a company. How on yeah. earth did you convince people? To, how did you find them and how did you convince them to join so, you? So uh, out of those 10 people, like three of them are Japanese. Yeah. So a lot of foreigners. Uh, it is difficult to convince uh, local. So finding Japanese. foreigners is easier then? Yes, exactly. At a foreign company and you have 
very international team. Uh, we hired some of them from abroad, actually, and helped them immigrate. Oh, to Japan okay. Sourced well. them outside and then brought them here. Okay. Yeah, from 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 Vietnam or Brazil or, or France, any any anywhere. These are uh, technical people. Uh, yes, technical and also design and project managers, data science. That's mostly. So staff. who does the selling? Who I mean, you know, if you're in Japan, <laughs> well, I guess if you're if you t- is your target Geishke companies and national multinational companies, still your target or mm-hmm. local companies? Yeah, both uh, local companies are. We haven't succeeded in no. cracking mm-hmm. <laughs> that problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So our sales team or not are quite light. Uh, me, um, two of my colleagues, uh, Japanese colleagues, also help me. Um, one of them more in is more as more marketing background, the other one more project management. So they mm-hmm. look at, at, at the opportunity in different angles. I brought you a book today, Japan yeah. Sales Mastery. I need this. I think I, this could be handy. I, I this totally could be this, this could be handy for you if you're doing sales here. This could I be handy. I need a lot of this because it's, it's yeah, you're, tr- you're trying to teach mastery. For me, it's still a mystery. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, mastery for mystery. That's a good. That's a good tagline. I should have thought of that when I wrote the book. Interesting. But so you, you managed easier. to find people. Though. You found Japanese to join you, which is quite impressive when you're a small yeah. company. It's not easy. Possibly, probably not the typical stereotype. Mm-hmm. Um, Japanese. How do you how do you locate? You're going through recruiting companies. You're advertising through LinkedIn or I don't know Facebook or TikTok or something. How the do you find initial them? members? Um, I uh, scouted them on uh, resume databases. Okay. You know, uh, that job. And okay. Another one. Uh, that was easier. You just contact. And, hey, you were opening an office and are interested and in, uh, giving a lot of background about what we're trying to do. We're, st- we're still quite an established company at that time um, because we almost had, like, yeah, eight years of existence. So not, you know, with, with some investment and willing to invest mm. in hiring a few people, finding an office, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so n- still a little bit easier if you're just bootstrapping. Like if you're an entrepreneur starting uh, in brand new ventures on your savings, I think it must be really difficult to convince anyone. Uh, but we well, were, it's hard to get a that. landlord to give you space for a start. They're like, "Who are you?" You know, yeah. I want uh, I want all this money up front. Uh, you know, I want guarantees. I want personal guarantees. It's not easy. Yeah. Did you use uh, shared space when you first started out? So it was sort of a bit of we a lighter a, touch. We use a Regis. Regis, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Big plug for Regis there. Hello, Regis. Yeah, that was uh, because yeah, you get stuck in that loop otherwise. Yeah. To get an office, you need a company. To have a company, you need an address. So you need an office. So you can't. There's you no, can't way, stuck. no way forward. Regis, we could have an address where we could register a company and we could contract them with our Hong Kong uh, uh, holding company directly. Oh, okay. So we could pay them for, from there. Mm-hmm. And so we could like to kind of initiate like the seed, <laughs> to plant the seed. And Regis, you had, uh, we had our own, own space, uh, small, but. On space in are you Bay. still are you still in Regis or have you no. broken out? You've got your own place. Then now? after maybe two or three years, we had our own mm. space. But by that time, we had a company, we had revenue, we had you know, we had a bank so account. And starting to work, yeah, yeah. Well, even starting a bank account is not that easy, right? Yes, yeah, so we got help from Jetro. Jetro is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and their program, like the one week training with different professionals, is great. That was great. You weren't in any of my classes I did for Jetro by any chance, were you? I, I did a whole I series of... I would have remembered. You would have remembered if I'd been given well, that class, Maxime. Would have been you would better. have remembered for sure. Remembered. Jetro, they'd contracted out the speaking spots to a number of companies, and I, I did four or five of these on the basics of doing business in Japan as one of the lectures they had the sort of experts on tax, experts on company formation, mm-hmm. registration. Yeah. They had a whole... Had a nice suite of, of services there for free. Yeah, my talk was for free, um, but then you know, whoever contracted me, they lost the contract, so I didn't have a gig there anymore. You know, I did, I'd say four or five. Yeah, yeah. So probably about the time that you no, that was kicked off. Yeah. That was really helpful. I was really surprised to have this help for free. Mm-hmm. And I always remember one of the consultant about inc- incorporating. I don't know if he was a lawyer or he was just talking about how to incorporate a company here. And he was asking me about my background and what did I do. And when I told him that I, I incorporated a Wufi, like a type of entity in China, 
wholly owned foreign entity. Uh, then he told me like, oh, Japan is much easier. Oh, really? <laughs> he thought yeah. so. Okay, that's yes. easier than China. Yeah, so he was not worried about me anymore Okay. when he heard what I had to go through in China. In China compared yeah. to, yeah, okay. So, you know, you've been going eight years in Japan now, mm -hmm. right? And um, so in terms of uh, the business, you know, you've you've got branches outside of Japan as well. Uh, I guess you've got some cross-pollination between companies. Multinational companies are in all different locations, so you can service them in Europe, you can service them in America, you can service them here in China. But in terms of uh, your experience here in just generally doing business compared to China, how would you compare it? Is China more flexible, more entrepreneurial, a bit more of the Wild West? Is Japan becoming easier? Your your lawyer just said that it must be easier to register than in China, but what's your reality been in terms of you compare the two countries? Yeah. So I don't have a lot of experience selling in China right. because our Chinese entity is actually having clients abroad, uh, which considering the crisis now over there, it's maybe a better. Uh, but definitely in China, people make decisions much more quickly. Right. Uh, you, you can have a no as an answer. Mm -hmm. Where here in Japan, you rarely have a no <laughs> as an answer. Yeah. So it's uh, difficult to work with. Uh, uh, it's very hard to read between the lines mm -hmm. in Japan. Um, you always have to do so in, in, in the sales process. Try to read the room and... Um, but the decision making is less transparent. Mm -hmm. It's harder to know what's going on, mm -hmm. who makes a decision eventually. Um, so there is a lot of, sometimes there has been a lot of excitement, excitement during sales meeting. Uh, me and my colleagues are happy. We think we made a good impression. We have identified a project where we can, we can create value. So there is just no brainer. Right, right. <laughs> this should happen, but but <laughs> but nothing happens. Mm. You don't have a no, you don't have a yes, you don't have any answer. Later, we'll consider it next yeah. year, and so it's uh, mm. limbo. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, do so you have any? Do you have any sort of um, uh, marquee clients? Like you have a big American corporation or big European corporation you work for, you can reference to say, hey, we work for you know. Well, I'll make it up. We work for Microsoft here in Japan. And that's all oh, you work for Microsoft. You know, that's got a lot of credibility because with sales here, as you say, it's all risk aversion, yep. caution, uh, don't want to make a mistake, uh, don't know who you are, are you reliable, are you going to be around? Okay, you've only been here eight years, you know, type of thing from their point of view. Do you have anything like that you can reference? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some track record. We have <clears throat> good case studies. Mm -hmm. uh, but I th yeah, the work we sell is like transformative, right? Yep. Digital transformation. So that means changing things, taking risks, um, and it's rebuilding what's existing. Mm -hmm. um, some people might not think it's broken, right? It works. The fax, the fax machine the works fax fine. Machine still works. Or the Excel Just stick the paper still in works. there and right. zing away it goes. So. Um, those are harder to sell, I think, and they impact many people. Um, so you need to have this consensus. Sometimes I think we're not Japanese enough, uh, maybe in our approach. Um, so people are wondering. When you say you're not Japanese enough in your approach, what are you doing you think is not Japanese enough? Like a, a team is, is quite international mm -hmm. and sometimes it scares a little bit. Okay. Um, do they speak? Do your team speak Japanese? Do they turn yeah. up speaking English? They speak yeah, Japanese. We have yeah. A few, okay. yeah. I mean, we have a few native speakers and fluent mm -hmm. speakers, um, but sometimes it's not very reassuring. Maybe I don't know. I'm trying to think of what else could go wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes we're not conservative enough, maybe in our approach, or um, yeah. But we're still we're still going to persevere. Uh, it's, Japanese, it's definitely easier for Japanese us. Japanese know that you know you're foreigners. You've only been here eight years, so they know. Okay, you're not going to understand 
the depths of Japanese culture, business culture, to the extent they know as natives. Yeah, no, and And they, right. they give you a bit of a, you know, a bit of flexibility if you screw things up from, you know, maybe a culture point of view. I have a few joker view. cards. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a margin there for us, isn't there? The sort of gaijin, so-called playing the gaijin card yeah. uh, to get past that. I try but, to not abuse it, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but definitely... Uh, it gives me more flexibility. Mm. Uh, some people are looking for our expertise because they don't want traditional Japanese. So oh, we had that as okay. well. They don't want traditional yeah. Japanese. They're looking for something I had, different. Uh, yeah, recently I met someone who, who clearly told me that uh, we're tired of all the IT vendors here. We want to see oh. something else. <laughs> so, we want to see something new. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's a, like, okay, we can do that. That's right? a USP right there, right? Yeah, Unique yeah. selling proposition right there. <laughs> Hang write that one down. Yeah. That's write good. that one down. That's good. Right. So yeah. Yeah. If you want something new, yeah. Mm. And what about with the team? You know, you've um, you know, you had one colleague here who moved to Japan to it was a 2014, I think yeah. you said, and then you came right. 2015. So there's just two of you at that time. Um so oh, he'd already hired she... people. So she she moved uh, to oh, Canada. She. Okay, sorry, she. Right after when we started, but I found two people to hire. So beginning, it was a, pretty much the first business day of 2015. I had like two people starting on their first day, and me coming from Shanghai. Oh, how, three did, you of man- us. how did you manage to hire them? You haven't even arrived yet. How did you Just do that? Just in December, making offer and like and and. You found them through Day Job or something like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then get them started, and I still remember that day pretty clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Arriving in Tokyo uh, with my luggage. Uh, Hi, I'm your and boss. And, yeah, exactly. Okay, that's our first day. <laughs> you know, that was something. Uh, it took her like a year, a bit more than a year, to get her first client locally here. Really? Okay. Had, that's a long time. That's a long time to yeah. be spending money and not well, making money. We had a lot money. of to, things to do. Really? We had to like. Yeah, even just translate the website and yeah. you know start to yeah. go to events, yeah, yeah. meet people. So but, we started from. You know. But that's impressive, though. I mean, to 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 have the money to sustain yourself, even though you've got a small number of people, you still got to feed them every month. Yeah. So feed bill is high when you don't have any capital. So they, they didn't you know, do anything. Cash or anything. Like that. I also so. give them like work we had from other offices. So um, those two people were working on projects like pretty quickly outside of japan yes right so they've actually got real work yeah and that was billable and not taking 100 percent of their time but also uh it was a way for them to understand how we work how we execute projects and uh kind of get into the company culture right not just waiting for work to arrive you know Uh, so that's did you have uh standard operating procedures sops from your work in china that you sort of bring here and say to people okay this is how this is how we do this, this is how we do this, this is how we do this. So it's easy for people to learn or is it individual instruction one by one? So no SOPs. No but, SOPs, uh, okay. A handbook. Handbook, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. An employee handbook. We already had that at the time. Uh, we had some, so for developers, we also had developer handbook and for PM, we also have PM handbook. I forgot at that time how well that was. That was maybe not as mature as it is today. Um, but we already had some playbook, right? So we China. don't want processes because we are like doing custom work, very, very custom. Uh, we want to, and the companies we work with are very different from one another in different industries, different sizes. And, and so we want to, we want to stay very creative on how we we'll approach. And so we restrain ourselves from having very well-defined procedures, um, because then we're just going to get trapped into that and okay. break the creativity, right? So right. my approach is just give guidelines and okay. playbooks and when you're in this situation, what can you do um, type of, of, of documentation, internal documentation, but not procedures. If A, then this. If B, yeah. then this type Otherwise, of thing. Like people turn off their brain. Sort of a decision tree type <laughs> of thing, yeah? Yeah, turn off their brain and then our, our, our job is evolving very, very quickly. So you know, we just keep maintaining them all the time. And in terms of leading the team, so you're actually you're hiring people from outside Japan, migrating here to work here, you're hiring local Japanese here. So after a while, you know, you, you get to a reasonable size, 10 people. Mm. So what have you found works well to uh, get people engaged in their work? Yeah, 
That's a very good question. Um, so what uh, we, in, in, in our company, we try to be very transparent. Hmm. Transparency is uh, very key. So we share a lot of data mm -hmm. uh, inside the company, like how much revenue and profit and cost and strategy roadmap. Uh, and one of the goal is to make people very like implicated and and, and engaged uh, with the, the company. We also share our mission, our goals, what we want to achieve. Um, so if so I, we want to if federate I, people around the, the, the company goals, right? If I grab my phone and I ring your company, I say, hello, it's Greg Story here. I've got, uh, I've got Maxine with me. What's the mission of the company? What's the direction of the company? What are the values of the company? Are they going to be able to tell me? Because my phone's just over there. I can test it if we need to. <laughs> Maybe uh, I would say not so not 100%. Uh, we do test that from time to time. Oh, you do? I think, uh, how do you uh, test yeah. it? It's in a questionnaire. Oh, a questionnaire. Yeah. Okay. That people like, like a little exam. Company? Yeah, kind of. But make it fun and engaging and short. And yeah, what do you think the company values are? And just ask a few people. Let's see who, if you get it right or wrong. <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> I think maybe issue, yeah, I think it? if a third, if if it's like thirty three percent understood, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Some people don't care. Like yeah. honestly, some people yeah. have no interest, mm -hmm. and they might still have like very important skills. That Technical you people need don't or, care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some some people really don't care. We still do. We we'll still be very engaged and do a mm -hmm. great job. And mm -hmm. uh, some people is very important for them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we do it, maybe not for everybody. So mm -hmm. that's one way to keep them engaged because to keep, to, to be like goal oriented and not task oriented. Mm -hmm. um, also very important because we're like a creative industry and so you need to use your brain. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, keep everybody engaged. Um, but in Japan has been traditionally people are trying to please the superior, like the N plus one, right? mm -hmm. and the level of hierarchy, and it has sometimes it's been difficult to break that. Right? To I remember have very long conversations uh, with some of my colleagues, and where they are trying to justify their what, why they did this, and, and all that, and like I don't care. Like, <laughs> don't try to justify your own actions with one way or the other. Uh, you know, I really don't. Like it, it's it's history, right? <laughs> so, uh, Are these mistakes they made, or could is, be. yeah, it can be, mistake or just the way or, they work? They're trying to explain the way they work to you. I mean, yeah. why? why yeah, yeah. yeah, they feel the need to tell you what they're doing. Yes, justify. And you don't itself. care. I don't care. Yeah. What do you care about? I care whether it worked or you not. Care about the results, right? Yes, <laughs> I care about the results. Exactly. Did it work or not? And I try to make them understand, like the results matter to you as well, because that's going to define mm. you increase. That's going to define you know, how much cash we have in the bank. Yeah. Uh, right. So uh, I try to make them engage. Like this is this is also your company. Right? Yeah. And uh, so if we don't perform well, it's going to impact you, and eventually it's going to impact your life. And yep. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the leadership training for managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication. Dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now.
these are important issues around uh, you know adjusting to how things are done in Japan when you're running an operation here around what the Japanese team think is important. And obviously, very easy for people to get tied up in the task and forget the big picture, which is yep. the actual money yeah. <laughs> coming in the door to pay for everything. Or it's, you know, customer satisfaction. It's customer right? satisfaction, things, reputation, right? yeah. brand, all that sort of stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. you're building a brand, right? And uh, in terms of, you talked before about, you know, you're looking for creativity, you're looking uh, for them to come up with interesting ways of doing things which are going to mark you apart maybe from your Japanese competitors or other competitors so you've got something unique about you. What have you found works well to get ideas from people to come up with that creativity? Well, I guess the, the first thing is to create an environment where it's safe to make a mistake, mm. right? Um, now, is that something that was different in China? For example, you know, Japan is a very highly risk-averse culture here. So that's an important issue. But I'm just wondering, you know, you're in China before. Yeah. Are the Chinese more okay with making mistakes? They see it as a learning opportunity rather than a disaster or very similar to Japan? Well, they also try to cover... <laughs> uh, try to hide it, right? Yeah. <laughs> try to hide it. Uh, there's also the... I think what's in common is being indirect, yep. right? And right. both uh, cultures, you kind of find that. Also, you need to make sure you like keeping the face. Um, like you can't really confront someone directly. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure they don't lose their face. Uh, that's... I think important in both, um, but I think in Japan is maybe like deeper, uh, maybe one more level. <laughs> uh, sometimes I had like it, it's hard to give feedback, so it's what I said earlier about like make sure you don't make them lose their face, but also to get the information, to right? Even get the, the feedback. Like so what do you do it? What's the problem right now? And it would tell you something, and then. Try to and then it doesn't always make sense. And you're like, no, I don't believe that. Really? Is that is that the real reason? And then you, and then you uncover another one, which is also still weird, and you, you still feel something is off. And then you keep asking. Onion and, layers. Yeah. Exactly. Peel back the onion layers. You don't really know. Like at the end, it's like, oh, did you go too deep? Maybe because then, or like, which layer was actually the the closest to reality? Uh, because you could have you could spend like two hours in that meeting, and you still haven't. Yeah, not really confident that you really uncover the real reason. Um, yeah, that's a point, isn't it? Be very I mean, hiding hiding mistakes, uh, I think, is sort of at ninja levels of expertise here in Japan because uh, every team I've ever run, the boss is always the last one to find out. And, you know, you tell people, say, look, uh, you're not going to get punished for making a mistake. It's just an opportunity to fix something or mm. learn from it. Hmm. It's not going to blow your career up, you know. Yeah. So it's better to tell me early because I've got the power, I've got the money, you know, I've got the ability to fix it, help you, get you out of trouble if I have time. Hmm. But if I don't have time, it all comes at the end. <sighs> all that stuff goes out the window. I can't do anything. It's, it blows up. So tell me early. I tell them that. But still, they're, you know, getting them to actually fess up and tell you something's not working is not easy. I try to lead by example. Right. So like you tell them all you. So I make I make mistakes, and I'm quite involved in a few projects as well. Uh, some of like some of my some of my colleagues say too much because then they distract me as a CEO. Um, but I'm a, I have an engineering background, and I'm still you know I'm still very interested into you know the the. the those problems, so I do spend quite some time in, involved deeply in a few key projects, um, and I make mistakes, right, as well. So I try to you know, be very open about it, and mm. you know, you share it. Oh, I should have done it that way, and mm. so you collaborate very closely to the same level, and you kind of yeah, you show that culture of like yeah, it's fine, it's what you need to do, and it's how you handle mistakes too. I mean, one of the problems is you you have the Typical corporate where, yes, there's no mistakes, there's only opportunities for learning, right? They say that at one level, right? And then someone screws up, whack! Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And they get blamed for the mistake and they get scolded for the mistake. And the people go, whoa, hang on a minute. No wonder they're hiding it, you know, like, oh, I'm going to bring yeah. up these mistakes. Look at the reaction I get. So I guess that your 
making yourself a model of transparency, but also, I guess, when they make mistakes, how you treat them, how you handle those mistakes is very important too. They see that, oh, what Maxime's saying is what he actually means as opposed to his propaganda. Yeah, but that, I mean, in digital you make, like, so a mistake can be like a bug is a so in a software, right? Um, so that's something that is quite, widespread <laughs> if you use software in general so maybe it's uh it's and it's usually not too bad, not too bad. right mm -hmm. it doesn't always have uh usually people don't die <laughs> as, yeah. a, as, a, as a result of of a bug um at least in what we do <laughs> so um the, there is a way to protect yourself uh, in, in a major event, right? And, and we do have things in place for those events, uh, recovery plans and all that things. And, you know, if we had data loss or security and all this. So this being covered, then everything, like the mistakes can be done or nothing really bad. I, I can sleep at night. Mm. About so, you're, so you're providing yeah. an environment of safety for them to make mistakes. That's yeah. one thing, to encourage creativity. Any yeah. other things you do you found that works well to have do you have stimulation sessions? Do you have scenario sessions? Do you have brainstorming sessions? I mean, you know, uh, anything you found works well to get people to come up with ideas to solve problems or to come up with better ways of, you know, building the mousetrap? Um, yeah, I don't, we don't really do formal brainstormings or anything like that. Uh, give a lot of autonomy. Okay. To a lot of people, uh, which is also part of our culture. We want to be, we want to make sure nobody is ma micromanaged. Um, everybody can organize their own time, uh, even like with flexibility of how you want to organize your time and your place is that, of work. Is that a problem with some of your Japanese staff? And I say that because for a lot of companies in Japan, the people are told what to do and therefore they come through their business education, not having autonomy and expecting to be told what to do. And therefore the accountability is with the boss, not with them. Uh, the thing is defined what they have to do. So they follow procedures, follow orders, pretty good at that. So how yeah. does that, how does that work? So I had maybe the first few years we had quite a few issues, but like I'm not clear what I should be doing. Um, mm. I had that feedback, like, I'm not sure what's our mission, what we're doing here, what it's supposed to do. I had that a lot. Tell me what to do, boss, and I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to tell them what to do. You say, so then, yeah. yeah, I didn't really to, to get to this level. Well, I mean, we can do this for a little bit, but, yeah. you know, that's not, it's not productive. Um, <clears throat> so then I think this is when we started to do more work around, like, presenting internally, roadmap, uh, quarterly updates, and, yep. and also create a, kind of middle management layer. Mm -hmm. So maybe for already like maybe five years now or so, uh, we had that better established where people have one-on-ones and can uh, discuss mm -hmm. maybe that, uh, that, that, mm -hmm. that level. Actually, Eddie Jones is back here as the rugby coach for Japan. And I remember years ago when he was a rugby coach here the first time, I went to a talk he gave. And it's very perceptive. He said, my problem is, as a coach, I can't be on the field with them. They're down there. I'm up in the stands. Uh, I can't micromanage them on the field. They have to make decisions based on what's going on in the course of play at that particular point in time. They have to take accountability. They have to take responsibility for it. But he said it's extremely difficult to get it out of their heads that the coach is going to tell them the play and then they just run that play the whole time, regardless of the actual context of the game, you know, and get creamed and get crushed because it's the wrong context, uh, it's the wrong play for that change in context. But he said, you know, it took him time to really educate people to say, I'm going to be accountable. Uh, I'm going to make a call on what we need to do based on what we see in front of us at the moment. So that's, you know, I think that whole corporate Japan take uh, and follow orders, or sorry, receive and follow orders. It's something you've hard to overcome, but do you think you've gotten past that now that people are more accountable, more free to take responsibility, call the play themselves? 
I hope so. I think so. But if it will, as we hire new people, then we have to also to go through this again. Right? Mm. Uh, the, so we try, of course, as you hire, you look at, you look for skills and you look for soft skills and company culture match. Uh, but I'm sure sometimes with some, the combination of all this makes it very difficult to find a suitable candidate. It's always a trade-off. Right? Mm. Uh, this person might have the skills, but not really great. And so you, you never have the ideal candidate. Uh, so I'm sure we're still going to be confronted into, into this. Well, send future. him to me, Maxime. All that soft skill stuff, I'll <laughs> fix it up for you. Okay. That's where we come into it. So in terms of trust, you know, we, we talked before about eight years into the company, first year, no no clients, even you're building, you're getting ready, you start to hire in, you know, people migrate here, you pick up Japanese locally. So what have you found works well to build trust with people? You talked about transparency before, so apart from that. Um, I think be interested into uh, into who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of create a disjoint between the role they're holding and who they are as a person. Um, so be curious about what they value and and. Yeah, where they come from, the culture, and then you, you, yeah, you create some kind of human connection, and it sounds a bit cheesy, maybe, but uh, <laughs> our whole business is built see, on the human connection. Don't, don't worry about the, that, you know. To, yeah, to see as them. you said before, you know, how to win friends and influence people is the classic book on uh, from Dale Carnegie on that human connection. It's incredibly so, important. So yeah, who to for who they are, and then it's easier to also to give feedback on their job because then you're criticizing their work, not them. Mm -hmm. um, but to get back to trust, uh, I mean, you build a trust by, you know, you make a promise and you fulfill that promise and you do that many, many, many times over. Mm -hmm. And after a while you create you could trust, so it's uh, so it's be very honest about yourself, about your weakness, and uh, also asking for their opinions mm -hmm. on things where you think they have more strength than you. Then you create uh, it also uh, also helps trust. Um, I guess in a ten-person yeah. size company, everyone has to do a bit of everything. You have to cover for each other. You're like you know, you're all in the all in the rowboat together, rowing. So that sort of sense of camaraderie, uh, esprit de corps, yeah. becomes important because it's not like you're a massive, big, you know, thousand person company. You're just a cog in the wheel. Mm -hmm. You actually everyone realizes they're an important uh, person in the organization. I guess. And we operate more as a one global group mm -hmm. of fifty two or so. Mm -hmm. than and do they feel that? Do the group. team in Japan feel they're, they're part of a 50 person company? I think so. Mm, yeah, because okay. quite a few of them work with projects with outside of with Japan. Colleagues. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But this is, this makes things even harder. <laughs> Why? Saying, yeah. Why? Why does it make it harder? <laughs> Our remote work is already not ah, simple, okay. right? Oh. Um, because I don't get to see 10 people face to face. Every so day. is your team mainly working remote? Um, more than 50%. Wow. I think okay. have, and that's every day of the we week? Four or five people in the office. That's so are they three day. days a week, four days a week, or no, week, no, no days a week? Th there's no hard defined rules. No rules. Right. Okay. So, so as it's you up feel. to, uh, yes, as you feel. If you think. So the introverts are all working at home. Exactly. And the extroverts are in having coffee together in the office. All right. And some, <laughs> a few people also live. Maybe a bit further outside of Tokyo, which doesn't no help. No commute. Mm. Yeah, so for them, yeah. So some people will just come once a week. Uh, some people that are maybe 15 minutes from the office, they will just come maybe three times. It really depends. We want to make people um, come from their own will. Mm. They choose. They need to understand mm. the benefit of 
coming to the office mm. uh, by themselves, mm. which is difficult. I am against like a hard defined rule. I made everyone here come of, back here in April. Out of nothing, out of <laughs> I nowhere. I did the other way. <laughs> Plus, in our industry, it's quite established that you know remote work is a standard. Mm. Um, but yeah, we have remote work, and then we have people on the other side of the planet that yeah. you have to work with, yeah. and you have so some colleagues have to build trust with working with someone who you never met. Yeah, I only have a few occasions listen to the voice, or maybe sometimes see on the camera and Google Meet. This is really difficult to have yeah. people work together and feel like they work within the same team. Yep, they never met. Each other. Yeah. I mean, I have last year I did like one round of all offices. I went to each of them physically uh, after the long COVID <laughs> period, um, and I met uh, quite a few people for the first time in in real life. Uh, so that was uh, here in Japan. Uh, no, in, in in different. So I went to the Vancouver office. I went. And to our Paris office. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. right. Overseas offices, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the whole um, group concept is very strong in Japan and remote work, in a way, is the antithesis of group because it's you individually locked up at home in your tiny little Japanese house or apartment working away with the kids running around. They can't be easy. <laughs> um, wife bossing you around or your husband bossing you around, <laughs> yeah. however that works. It can't be easy. And so, uh, I, but I guess, you know, you're, by having no definition, you're actually making people accountable, responsible for choosing the style of work they want to perform. And therefore, with that goes the accountability of the results, right? So if you're goofing off at home watching Netflix and not working, you're not producing. So, you know, there's a quid pro quo here between yeah. I give you freedom, but I also expect you to be honest, transparent and be producing, yes. right? Yeah, so yeah, right. That. This is, yeah to cr create accountability right mm. you're you're a grown-up yeah you yeah you're an adult yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're an adult yeah. so uh we give you flexibility because yeah maybe you want to drop your daughter in the morning and yeah uh, maybe this afternoon uh, he or she is sick and it's better if you stay at home and those things the things happen right yeah and then maybe you're make... working at 11 o'clock at night to catch up or something you know yeah so we want to make life you know, convenient mm. to everyone um, but so we give that flexibility, but sometimes we need that flexibility too. Sometimes mm. there is a late, a late night call mm. uh, with another office or, mm. or, or a customer uh, in North America. Mm. And so we, we also ask mm. for flexibility. So it makes sense. We give that flexibility in the first mm. place, right? Mm. Yeah. What about culture? You know, you start, you start in China. So the firm takes on a certain type of culture from the beginning as a startup. Yep. Then it matures and you're in... Chinese culture you're there and then you bring it to Japan and you start from zero with one one person then you join and you've got a couple of people joining about the same time day one of your first day here and uh, so what were your thoughts about okay am I going what am I going to do here in terms of building a culture of this company for the future or did you not have that in mind yeah I had that in mind um, and for me I was kind of the ambassador to try to bring the culture together with me um, and our culture has evolved since then right maybe at the early days was a lot of like work hard play hard and okay we're young and <laughs> uh, what did the what did the play hard bit look like I know what work hard looks no, like no, what, no, for you guys what does play hard yeah, look I like I can't share this <laughs> can't share that oh okay this sounds like a good podcast we can have on that one but i mean is it things like you know you go but, out for drinks is it parties is it bowling i mean what is it yeah right is yeah, that that's it. yeah yeah that was, it. that was it was happening um quite a lot and uh, to create like bounds and i think that was yeah that was quite important and i think we're all a bit younger than where we are now then the caring was really strong, um, really everybody feeling like a family and caring for each other mm -hmm. and helping out if there's any difficulties or uh, things like that. Then after a while, we realized that having a strong, caring uh, culture um, uh, goes against performance, results driven, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like balance, you have to find a balance between mm -hmm. each of them. So we try to like kind of bring back like to steer it a little bit like yes we all care about each other but also like you know you also need to perform 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and learning. You also need to always like challenge yourself and review how you work and learn new things. And you know, because again, this is we also need to transform ourselves. We help transform others, but we also need to yeah. keep in mind that do it on yourself, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> do it on ourselves. A bit of a digital sure. transformation on yourself in the company. Yeah, fair enough. And what about you know? I mean, you've been here since 2015, I think you said, right? So you've been here a long time now, eight years, and you've, you know, you start, start up from zero and you've built a company and you've now got 50 odd people globally in a number of different continents. You've got people working with, uh, you know, some very high level companies. So, you know, they're doing work inside Japan, outside Japan. So you've got experience. So Maxime, if one of your, one of your mates called you up and said, Maxime, I've got the job in Tokyo. They're going to send me there to run the Japan operation. But Maxime, I don't speak Japanese. I don't know anything about Japan. Maxime, what do I need to do to be successful in business in Japan? Run, lead the organization. What's Maxime's advice? What's he going to say? <laughs> Think it again. <laughs> Why did they pick you? <laughs> um, there's a reason, right? Probably. Uh, <clears throat> um, Why to start? Actually, all my all my professional experiences in Asia, like China mm -hmm. and Japan. So, mm -hmm. uh, in some way, I'm a bit I have a bias here. But I guess like try to understand the people, the culture, the people, the language. Be mm -hmm. curious about the language. You're not going to be to be able to learn and master business Japanese and before you land in Japan. <laughs> uh, I haven't yet. Uh, so this takes uh, time, but at least start and be curious about it. Uh, you will need to master reading between the lines and uh, uh, looking body language and really and just like feel the air and uh, have a lot of empathy uh, to, to like project and and. You can just like very quickly give some instructions and leave the room. I think. Uh, you have to, yeah, because the people won't tell you if they, they won't raise their hand if they didn't understand or anything like that. Hmm. You give the instructions, you leave the room, they've got no clue and you don't know until nothing happens. Right, and you come back to <laughs> Where's that later. project? It hasn't yeah, started. Yeah. What? <clears throat> so, <laughs> yeah, you, and then you have to be patient. I think, uh, yeah, things in Japan take some time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was warned, myself, I was warned uh before like starting business here that things take time here so i knew this you know it would take it some time to sign a first client um so if you yeah if you you, you don't move here like uh, as you, you took this example for six months but plan to stay here like five to ten years uh minimum i would say uh, so but often they don't have that luxury. Often they're sent for three, four, maybe five years as a posting, and then they have to be sent somewhere else. So they don't have a 10-year you know, frame of reference. It's not that luxurious. Yes, yeah, so it depends on what they do. I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe, their, like, maybe their skills can be applied in a shorter time frame, right? Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. yeah. If you start operations, you're head of a country, uh, head, of, head of the country, or if you're like a general manager or starting moving a business, starting a unit here or something like that, I think you need this type of time frame. You're not going to get it done mm -hmm. in, a, in a few months, unless maybe you already have traction, you already have clients here or something like that. But, and what about in the case if they're a startup? Say you've done that, you've gone from zero, you know, uh, to your company size now. What would be some advice for others who are thinking about doing a startup in Japan? What would you say to them? Uh, as a startup, like, so yeah, hiring the first talents would be very difficult. Um, or looking for co-founders as well. Um, do you have a co-founder in Japan? No. You didn't, no, no, but do you but think I mean, that's, that's a good idea? Yes, if you need to, to, depending on the startup you, you're starting, like if, you, if, you, if you're doing a B2C and you really need to understand the customer base and their needs, and yes, yeah, probably essential. 
to have someone that uh, have a deep understanding. But again, it depends on like the products you're selling or. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, apart yeah. from apart from just generally speaking about startups, if you're hiring people, you know, you said very difficult at the beginning. What other things do you think would be good advice for people trying to do a startup here? After you've been through that process Don't yourself now. <laughs> Don't, Don't give up. <laughs> okay. Don't give up. That's good advice. <laughs> Don't give up. It's not going to be easy, so don't give up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's uh, it's not the easiest country, I would say, as a startup. Mm. Not the easiest. Because? Country. A lot of people don't want to take risks in their professional career. So they won't, they won't use you because your yeah. risk aversion sends right. them away from you. People changing jobs is still new. Yeah, yeah. In Japan. Talent so. pool is, is not so flexible yet. Yeah. And we're not in the lifelong employment anymore, mm. I guess. People mm. do switch jobs, but they're very, very careful. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very unlikely they will move to, you know, a new venture, a new startup that has a lot of risks and uncertainties. There's not as much like social protection if you lose your job or things like that here. So... Uh, yeah, it doesn't help. Right. Hmm. How about your definition of leadership? What's your definition of leadership? Um, whether you can inspire people with a with a mission and 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 create some excitement and motivation. Um, also, a good leader should uh, have them grow. Uh, professionally and I think personally as well. It has to go with their own personal plans. Like if they also, like for example, if they're raising a family, I think it's very important to understand that and and make sure the the career plan is aligned with whatever mm -hmm. personal um, uh, plans they also have. Um, I say this is because I, here we have like, people changing offices or moving back to their home country and and uh, and having different you know, events in their life and uh we try to accommodate that and uh, and i think thanks to this we have a big part of the team that has been in the maybe we have half of the team have been in the company more than six years or so so it's uh, mm. i'm pretty proud of that mm. um what else a good leader uh, i think that they can be clear in his expectations mm -hmm. that's basic but <laughs> it's a, what do I expect from you? And I think be 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 very clear and 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 honest about it. Yeah. Hmm. You know, we've we've ranged around a broad spectrum of subjects today. But is there anything that we haven't covered? You think is important on the topic of leading in Japan that we didn't get to today? Any additional you can think of? It's not a requirement, but just something pops into your mind. In. I think uh, how it's different in the different industries, like manufacturing and and digital and, and design, and um, I think it can be quite different. Um, and also, I'm interested in the history, how things evolve, and how they might be in the future, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, how, for example, the gig the gig economy and the, the state of that in Japan, and uh, with the for freelancers and, and, and all that and so we, I, we just talked about like life lifelong employment and what are the trends i'm mm -hmm. interested in two of those topics yeah mm -hmm. mm. all right i think we covered a fair bit today thank you maxine appreciate that thank, thank you for joining me thank talking you, about your company yeah, it was a pleasure so join us again for our next episode of japan's top business interviews